Hello, Asheville. You are listening to WPVM 103.7 on your dial and at WPVMFM.org globally. I am your host, Crystal Sunnius McKinnon, and today we are continuing our series of interviews for the NC11 congressional race with Republican candidate Bruce O'Connell, who is joining me remotely. Um, Bruce is one of four Republicans taking on incumbent Madison Cawthorn in the Republican primary. Please note that you can also view this broadcast archived on the WPVM Facebook page and website. So Bruce, thank you so much for being here to share your platform with the community. Thank you, Crystal, for having me. So do you want to walk us just briefly through your career and what led you here, why you decided to jump in now? Sure. I've lived in the Western North Carolina area now for over 40 years. I've got deep roots now with the community and the mountains, and my heart is here. I uh, own and operate the Pisgah Inn on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I've done that for 40 plus years now since I first got here. I'm a businessman, but I'm also a, a lover of the mountains and the environment. I've got one son, two grandsons, a wonderful mom, and I'm uh, presently with a wonderful woman in a committed relationship, and I'm as happy as I could be. I've got everything I want right now in life. I grew up in a hotel. My parents were in the hotel business, and I've really been in the hotel business my entire life. And back in 1979, my parents came out of retirement, wanted to invest and manage a small bed and breakfast in the mountains of North Carolina, and they called me and asked me to join them here to help them for the first season. I came to North Carolina not knowing what it held for me, but I was obligated and wanted to help my parents. After that first season, when it, the inn closed, I had to find another job, so I traveled to a ski area and worked in the ski resorts for the winter. And then my dad asked me to come back again for the next season, and that became a pattern for me for the next five years or so. In 1985, my father passed away. That left my mom and I to run the inn, and from that point, I've stayed here year-round because there is work to do in the winter, even though the inn is closed. I have a bachelor's degree from Cornell University from the School of Hotel Administration, and uh, that has afforded me uh, the ability to really do a good job, I believe, at the inn, and uh, my track record, I think, would testify to that. The uh, seasonal nature of the inn being closed in the winter has given me the time to pursue other jobs and other, other things. Um, I'm imaginative and I like to do different things. For example, one winter I substitute taught both in primary, secondary and elementary schools. One winter I was an adjunct professor at AB Tech in the hospitality department. Another winter I bought a septic tank pump truck and I went out and I got a, a CDL license and I went to pumper school. And I was a <laughs> septic tank pump guy. And the idea was to hire drivers, which I was never able to do. And after two years of doing that, I realized I couldn't run the inn and drive a septic tank pump truck and dig up septic tanks. So I sold the truck and sold the business, but it was a great experience. One winter, I've got a little bit of land. I decided to get into farming. So I planted hemp and I planted 1200 hemp plants and I nurtured them from the planting through the harvest all the way to the curing. And then I created my own line of CBD products, which I'm selling right now. I have CBD tincture and CBD topicals under the brand name of Monarch Farms. I've learned a little bit about farming doing that. I'm also a, a passionate scuba diver. And because of that, I uh, am a cave diving guide. I go down to Mexico in the winters. I love to cave dive and I love to guide people in the underwater caves of the Yucatan Peninsula. I think cave diving has really taught me a lot about dealing with stress and how to plan for a worst case scenario. And that served me well at Pisgah Inn because at times operating the inn can be very difficult. I've also been in a band. I play guitar, been in a couple bands, and I still play a little bit, but not in a band. I've dabbled in real estate, property management, done a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But uh, my passion is the Pisgah Inn. It's my baby. And I intend to be there till the government doesn't want me there anymore. My present contract doesn't expire till 2027. I'm fortunate that I've got a great leadership team up there who have encouraged me to run for Congress. They keep telling me I'm the best man for the job and that they've got my back. And with their encouragement and the encouragement of everyone else, I've decided to run for Congress because I'm not happy with the direction of the country and I'm not happy with our present leadership. So, 
I really think I'm a good steward of the environment. I drive a 1985 Mercedes 300D turbo diesel every day. It runs on waste vegetable oil from my restaurant. I've named my car French fry because it smells like French fries. And all the neighborhood dogs chase me when I leave and return to the house every day. I love my car and I'll continue to drive it till it falls apart. They say it's a million mile vehicle. I speak a little Spanish. I love the Latino community. Mi Espanol no es bueno, pero practico todo el día. And other than that, that's a little bit about me. All right. Well, you're a very, you're a real Renaissance man. Well, I've been um, called that before. So let's, you mentioned Madison Cawthorn and that you're dissatisfied with our current leadership. So let's talk about him briefly. Don't want to spend too much time on him. Uh, he's been in the news a lot lately, although that's pretty consistent. But, uh, you know, recently he was allegedly bringing knives to a school board meeting. Um, he, of course, there's been all the kerfuffle around his comments about January 6th, which he later walked back on somewhat, but nonetheless, it went viral and I don't think it's something that's easily forgotten. And then, of course, very recently, he's issued a statement um, talking about some very serious medical issues that he's having related to his accident. So in general, um, briefly, and we will go through your whole contract, but how do you differentiate yourself from him? What are you dissatisfied about with him and, and how are you gonna fill that role differently? Well, first of all, I voted for Madison and I donated to his campaign. I do believe it's important that Republicans keep the seat in Congress more important is that we take the Congress and hopefully the Senate and eventually the presidency back. Madison, his rhetoric, it, it's, it's not productive. I believe he's ostracized himself from many people in Congress, and I believe that's making him less effective at introducing and fostering good legislation for our district. He's rendering himself ineffective in Congress because of his divisive rhetoric. In addition to that, we all probably already know that Madison has missed more votes than any other freshman congressman in history. And you know, when you're elected to Congress, one of your jobs is to vote. And if I had an employee that I hired to do a job and they performed the way Madison has performed, I would question whether that employee needs to keep his job. Now, Madison seems to spend a lot of his time gallivanting around the country promoting himself. That's fine but not at the expense of the district. There's lots of issues here in the district that I've been talked to about that need to be addressed. There's the lack of the unserved pockets for internet all around the area. There's affordable housing issues, low wage issues. There's the opioid problem. There's homelessness. There's so many issues that need to be addressed here and I don't see it happening for Madison. So I, I believe I can do a better job. I will take a businessman's approach to Washington. Okay. Uh, I have to ask, do you believe that the presidential election was free and fair? Do you believe that Joe Biden is the legitimate president? It's a good question. I do accept Joe Biden as our legitimate president. That being said, I have suspicions about the last election and I question some of it. I certainly think we need to look forward though, not look backward. There's really nothing we can do constitutionally or otherwise about what's happened in the previous election but I do think we can improve election integrity going forward. Specifically, I'm 100% in favor of voter ID. I'm 100% in favor of signature verification. I'm 100% in favor of controlled chain of custody of the ballots. And I'm 100% in favor of bipartisan observers, both at the polls and when the ballots are being counted. So once again, looking backward, not productive. Looking forward, necessary. We need to make sure the voting is fair and the elections are fair. And I believe that that's a common desire. Liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, no one can deny that we all want fair elections. And, and reaching out to everyone about common things is the way you bridge the gap and, and end the divisiveness that this country is in right now. We do have lots of commonality and one thing that I believe we have in common is that we all want free and fair elections. Do you feel like in general that 
speaking of divisiveness, that Trump really stoked that um, in his presidency, before his presidency, and, and since? Here's what I think about President Trump. I do not worry about personalities when it comes to politics. I'm concerned with policies. Whether or not President Trump's personality had room for improvement is not as important to me as whether or not his policies were the right ones for the country. And I will go on record now as saying I believe President Trump's policies were spot on. Okay. Um, and I, I'm not so much asking what you think about his personality, more so what effect he may have had to promote divisiveness. I don't think there's very many people who don't acknowledge that he is a very divisive character. I would imagine intentionally so. I don't believe he's a divisive character. I question that comment. Okay. I believe that, for example, with the January 6th protest in Washington, some people accuse him of inciting that. Well, if you listen to what President Trump said, his own words say, peacefully protest. I don't believe he wanted an insurrection, as some people call it. Now, if you want to talk about insurrections, look at what happened back in the summers of 2020 in many American cities when they were on fire. That was closer to an insurrection, in my opinion, than what happened in Washington. Now, that being said, there were some of the protesters in Washington that stepped over the line. They engaged in criminal activity. And whether it be a liberal or a Democrat, a liberal or a uh, conservative or a Democrat or a Republican, if someone breaks the law, they need to pay the consequences. Those people that stormed the Capitol or threatened, threatened lawmakers, they need to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. But I do not believe what happened in Washington was an insurrection. It was a protest with some of the people who overstepped their bounds and became criminals. So President Trump is not responsible for that, in my okay. opinion. Okay. Um, so on your website, you have a contract with the district, um, a promise, if you will, which is unique. Um, so I thought maybe we can go through it sort of subject by subject. Um, that you have on there, and then we'll go on to some other policy questions. Um, so we already, your first promise is never miss a vote. Uh, you already commented, of course, that Cawthorn has missed a historic number of votes. So presumably you're making a counterpoint to that, stating that promising that you all, you will be there as much as possible. That's correct. First of all, you're paid to do a job when you get elected. One of those jobs is to vote. Now, I understand that Madison fell in love and got married. That's fine. I understand husbandly responsibilities, and I agree with those as well. But, you know, he could have voted by, voted by proxy. There was no excuse to miss all those votes. So I pledge to make every vote. I will not miss a vote. That would be what my job is, and I will commit to that. It's an easy commitment to make. Okay. And then you've got um, fight for our farmers and our agricultural communities. Um, so how would you approach doing that? Well, I've spoken with many of the farmers all over the district, but particularly in Henderson County. And I've listened to what they've got to say about the problems. And did you know that farms are disappearing, first of all? Uh, development is eating up all of the farmland. And pretty soon there's gonna be no more farms. The dairy farms are almost extinct now. And some of the farms where they plant crops are struggling because they can't get labor to harvest the crops. So the ways I would try to help some of the agricultural community would be to work on an immigrant worker program to allow immigrants to legally come in the United States, work legally, and then return to their countries. You see, if we can't fuel and feed ourselves as a country, we're doomed. And that phrase is not mine. That's what the farmers told me, and it rang true with me. If we can't fuel and feed ourselves as a country, somewhere in the future, we're going to be in a bad way. Okay. So that's what you mean by innovative labor sourcing and exactly. basically allowing migrant farmers to come in, work, and then leave, and then presumably do the same thing again. The what I believe year. is, is that Americans nowadays will not pick crops and I'm a businessman and I'm practical. These farmers are running a business. They're trying to feed us. They plant the crops, they grow the crops, 
they take a risk. But if they've got no one to harvest the crops, they rot in the fields. There needs to be a program, a legal process for immigrant workers to come across, work, pay taxes, and not be afraid of being deported. That being said, Crystal, I am 100% in favor of legal immigration. I am 100% in favor of completing the border wall. The wall does not need to be entirely brick and mortar. It can be virtual. We can use drones. We can use surveillance. But we need borders. Without borders, we have no country. And by the way, I don't know if you've seen what's happening in the news lately. I call what's happening at the southern border right now an invasion. Are you talking about the Haitian? I'm talking about 14,000 people camping under a bridge on the American side of the Rio Grande River. And the the border uh, patrol agents are being overwhelmed. If that doesn't scare everybody, Democrats, Republicans, liberals and conservatives, I don't know what will. I consider that to be an invasion. And those people are from Haiti, correct? I believe recently a lot of them are from Haiti, but I've seen statistics that say they're from all over the place, including the Middle East, including South and Central America. They're coming from everywhere. It's obvious that the Biden administration has said to the world, bring everybody in, now's your chance, and they're all coming. And the evidence is clear. We have no border down there in Texas, and I feel so sad for the people of Texas that live on the border. Some of those people, those farmers, they're living under fear for their lives right now because there's no law enforcement able to come to them when they need help because all the law enforcement right now is dealing with processing these immigrants. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a debacle. And, and how come nothing is being done about it is beyond me. If I go to Washington, I can assure you I'm going to speak up about it because it makes common sense. Anyone that thinks there's not a major problem down there isn't opening their eyes. Common sense says we need borders. We need legal immigration. America is a melting pot. It's worked great for us. But a melting pot means that people come in legally and they assimilate. They become American. They pledge allegiance to the American flag. That's what the melting pot theory is all about. It worked very well, but it doesn't seem to be working now. Well, I am familiar with South Texas because I, I'm actually from the Rio Grande Valley. Um, my mother's family, uh, all, most of them still live there. Um, needless to say, we are Hispanic. Um, so, but I would ask, how do you feel like Joe Biden has, as you say, sent the message to the world that our borders are open? That's easy. Look at what's happening right now on the border. Thousands of people are coming across and more people are following them. Is but what did he do to cause that? I'm sorry? What did he do to incite that? He's taking no action to stop it. And by doing nothing, you encourage it. It's that simple. Well, Vice President Harris ha did travel to I believe Guatemala and said to those people, do not come here. Um, I think their message has been actually do not come here. So I think now do people from other places believe they can now come here? Yes. And so that could be causing an influx, but I don't know that they're, it's not like they're letting people in. Crystal. I've been to the border. I drove down there to see it for myself recently. I went to Piedras de Negras and I went to Del Rio. Go there for yourself and well, take Well, the situation a look. in Del Rio is very unique, but I don't think it's representative of the entire border. We are being invaded, Crystal, and nothing's being done about it. Go talk to law enforcement down there. Go talk to the border control, border patrol. Go for yourself. That's what I did. I didn't want to believe the news media because really I don't trust the news media that much anymore, whether it be the liberal media or the conservative media. So I got in my car and I drove to the border Yeah. and I saw it for myself. There's no doubt in my mind we're okay. being invaded and it's I... because it's an open border right now. It's porous. Okay. And don't get me wrong. I love the Latino community. I spend a lot of time in Mexico. They're great people. 
They're great workers. They've got great family values. We need them in this country, but we need them legally. Legal immigration, Crystal, is what I'm saying. But flooding the border, crossing it illegally, unacceptable to me. Understood. Um, I mean, I don't disagree with that. And uh, I probably will not drive down there, but I will call my family members in the Border Patrol and see what they say. Please Sincerely. Do. Yeah, don't trust um, the media. I don't. Okay. All right. Um, I, I, that's a little awkward for me uh, <laughs> as part of it. But <laughs> oh, that's okay. I don't mean you. President <laughs> So let's go on and talk about some other ma matters of national security since you went there, um, particularly with Afghanistan, China, and even COVID. Um, what are your thoughts on the manner in which we pulled out of Afghanistan? It was a mess up, no doubt about it. Anybody with any, once again, common sense would have to agree that Number one, we needed to get out of Afghanistan. I was all for it. 20 years is way too long. We're not a country that's supposed to build nations around the world. We can help our neighbors when they ask for help, and I think we should, but we're not nation builders. We've been in Afghanistan too long, and we needed to get out. My son was in Afghanistan, and I wanted him brought home as soon as he could come home. That being said, how do you leave a situation like that correctly? Well, as has been said before, you first make sure all U.S. citizens are out safely that want to get out. Then you make sure all the SIV holders that want to leave are out safely. Then you get all of the military equipment and ammunition out or you disable it or destroy it. Then the military pulls out. That would be the common sense way to leave Afghanistan. Instead, well, instead you see what happened. We've lost troops. We've got drone strikes killing families now. Our allies have lost confidence and trust in us, and we've emboldened our enemies throughout the world. This was a big mistake, and I look at it like an emotional bank account with our allies. We've made a withdrawal from that emotional bank account now, and it's easy and fast to make a withdrawal, but it's going to take a long time to put that deposit back in our emotional bank account and prove to our allies that we're trustworthy and then they can count on us. I think we can do it, but I think it's going to be a tough road to hoe. And I think it's going to take people like me in Congress that can stand up for what's right and stand up for common sense. I keep saying this. It's common sense. How could anybody look at the way we left Afghanistan and think we did it the right way? It was a debacle. Okay. So obviously because of what we did, presumably, the Taliban is now in power and um, they're being treated like legitimate heads of state by China in particular. Um, China's making great overtures there in cooperation with the Taliban to expand their belts and roads initiative. Um, do you think that China form, I'm sorry, presents, poses an existential threat to the United States? You know, I'm not a politician, but I do try to follow all the affairs affecting our country. So I'll start off by saying I know a little bit about China because I've studied it. And China, in my opinion, is our greatest adversary internationally right now. China right now had a lethal engagement on the China-Indian border recently. It's the first time since 1975 that's happened. Right now, China is in a dispute with Japan over rights in the East China Sea. Japan is one of our allies. Right now, there's friction growing and China is threatening Taiwan with a takeover. Right now, Hong Kong is being threatened and lives in fear of a Chinese takeover. China is now increasing its cooperation with Russia, which is another one of our adversaries. China is a top threat to our country over technical, technological, commercial and military assets. Did you know that China is, gonna, is due to double its, its nuclear stockpile within the next 10 years? China is about to establish a robotic base on the moon, and they're soon going to follow up with that with humans on the moon. China is prolific at cyber espionage, and China definitely does not have an interest in individual human rights. They value state sovereignty over individual human rights. Now, 
we can talk about all the reasons why we should fear China, but it's more important to talk about how we need to respond to it. I don't claim to have all the answers, but I know it's got to be a, a multi-pronged approach to respond to China. There's a term that's used in Washington called DIME, D-I-M-E. It stands for Diplomacy, Informational, Military, and Economic Pressure. That four-pronged approach is probably the best way to approach the Chinese threat, but we certainly need to consider China our major international threat, and we cannot lose focus of that. If we're not careful, the Chinese yen is going to replace, the Chinese uh, currency is going to replace the U.S. dollar as the world reserve currency. And if that happens, if you think inflation is bad now, hold your hat, because overnight the dollar is going to drop precipitously, and we're all going to be in a state of shock. We are lucky that the U.S. dollar has been the world reserve currency for a long time, and a lot of people don't really understand what that means. I do. I have looked at the United States financial statements. Take a minute and Google financial statements of the United States. I'm a businessman. I can read balance sheets and I can read P&Ls. I'm not an accountant, but I can read a balance sheet. Google the financial statements of the United States. It's a document prepared by the government that's given to every congressman, every senator, the president, and it's available for public consumption. There's something strange about that document. It comes out every year. There's one common phrase throughout the entire 200 pages of that document, and that phrase is unsustainable. And I've got to ask the question, if congressmen and senators every year are getting financial statements for this country, and the most common phrase in them is unsustainable, why has nothing been done? Why has nothing been said? And why are we not talking about that? We're risking the economy. And if it was a business, the business would have already failed. That's why I think we need more businessmen in government that look at things from a businessman's point of view. And that's what I plan to do if I get elected. Okay. Well, then on that note, let's jump to balancing the budget, um, which is another one of your points on your contract. Um, how would you propose doing that? Where would we presumably cut back? We must balance the budget. And the first way to do it, in my opinion, is to send a symbolic symbol to the world. And that symbol would be that we're going to pay down the national debt. The national debt is now approaching $30 trillion. The word is, is that we're leaving it to our grandchildren to pay off. Well, I hate to say it, it ain't going to happen. It's impossible. It's never going to get paid off. But you know, when you get sick and have a major illness and the hospital keeps sending you a bill and they keep badgering you to pay your bill, what I found is if you can make up a payment plan and send the hospital five or $10 a month, they will get off your back. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe we need to do something similar to that as a symbolic gesture to the world that we are planning on trying to pay back the national debt. Let's start making payments on it, number one, no matter how small they are. And if you've noticed from my contract, I have pledged not to take a salary. I'm not in this for the money. I don't need the money. I'm not mega wealthy. I'm not a Donald Trump, but I have everything I need in life. You know, there's a Mexican saying, who is richer, he who has more or he who needs less? Well, I don't need much. I think I'm as rich as I need to be. And for that reason, I've pledged that if elected, I will not take a salary. I'm going to donate it to worthy causes in the district. Further, if I get elected, I've pledged to serve a maximum of three terms. I am self-imposing term limits on myself. And the reason for that is because I believe the founders never intended for politicians to make careers out of it. We are servant leaders. We are civilians that go to politics to help and then we come back to the private sector. That's what I plan to do. But getting back to your question, we are gonna symbolically begin to pay off the debt. We are not gonna spend money that we don't have. And that means cut back on wasteful programs, wasteful government regulation, and the size of government. Because if there's one thing I repeat as I go around the district, one of my philosophies is big government bad, small government better. Our government has gotten too big to manage. 
It's too big. For example, look at the infrastructure bill, the so-called infrastructure bill, $3.5 trillion. Look at it. Have you read it? I pulled, I pulled it up, 2,000 pages. It was so long that no one can really read it and understand it. But one thing's for sure. It is so big and so massive that no one can really understand it. It's impossible to manage. Now, what do I think we ought to do about things like that? Well, I'm a believer in infrastructure. But if you borrow money to repair infrastructure, say a bridge or a road, you need to have a plan to pay it back. Now, if you look at this giant document of 2,000 pages, it's so massive that no one can have a plan to pay it back and no one can even manage where the money goes or how it's dispersed. It's impossible. So what we need to do is never have a bill that big. If there's a bridge in Iowa that needs to be replaced, we need to have a bill to allocate federal dollars and state dollars to repair that bridge. If we have roads in North Carolina that need to be replaced and it can be federally aided and using state funds and federal funds, then we need a bill to address the roads. In other words, we can't have these gigantic bills throwing away trillions of dollars that are impossible to manage. I run a business and I know when businesses get too big, quality suffers, control suffers, efficiency suffers and things get out of control. And that's what's happened to the federal government. It is too big. Small government better, big government bad. Do you think that uh, as a business person who also believes in small government, what do you think about antitrust laws when it comes to companies like Amazon, which as you know, are you're suggesting that when something gets too big, it, it can't be well managed. Would you um, apply that to a company like that as well? I would. Remember what happened to AT&T or Bell South? Mm -hmm. There was a time when Ma Bell, they called it Ma Bell, really had the monopoly on telephones throughout the country. Then prices were shooting up. The Congress decided that was a monopoly. It was a violation of antitrust. They broke up the bell system. Now we've got phone companies all over the country, big and small, that are helping to make long distance phone calls cheap and affordable. When I was a kid, to make a long distance call, it cost a fortune. Now you get free long distance service on your cell phone. That's because of antitrust laws. Amazon is too big. It needs to be broken up. And on that same note, Big tech, social media is running into the same sort of quagmire. I believe social media is too big. They're controlling free thought. They're controlling the dissemination of information. And they're exempt from lawsuits due to Section 230. You know, newspapers, which used to be the source of our news, were subject to being sued if they slandered someone. Well, if Facebook slanders someone, they have no worries because they're exempt from being sued. They can say anything they want. They can allow anything they want to be posted and they're free from being sued. That is very risky considering that social media is now the main source of our news. Now, Facebook has responded and the other social media platforms have responded, don't worry, we will make sure that no one posts anything false. We will make sure that no one posts anything that's slanderous. Well. That may sound good, but they've used that as a ploy to censor free speech. And if we're going to be relying on social media as our main source of information, we must insist that it's free and open. They should not have the right to censor. When we read a newspaper when I was younger, you had to determine what was true and what wasn't true. You had to determine what to believe and not believe. Well, I believe social media has no right to censor anyone and I believe what they're doing is destructive to freedom. And I believe we've got to get social media under control and they should be subject to Section 230. Well, I mean, how do you hold a private company accountable for controlling what they want on their own platform? Just as an example, there's some food for thought. Um, you know, they employ censorship in other areas as well, such as suppressing um, sex worker accounts, even in places where sex work is legal. Um, 
so those are just based on their terms of service. Where There's would we the draw the line between allowing a platform to shape itself and the government intervening to protect freedom of speech? Here's the difference. The big social media platforms are monopolistic. We have no other options. You see, we can't go to another Facebook because they don't exist. And when another Facebook gets created, say a parlor or something like that, they get taken offline because there's powers out there that control the internet. It is not the same as just any private business. I am in favor of private businesses being able to self-determine what they want to do, who they want to serve, and what kind of business they want to be. Because for example, if a bakery doesn't want to make a cake with a, a husband and a husband as the ornament, I can go to another bakery. I don't have a problem with that. But if Facebook censors Donald Trump, for example, and I want to hear what Donald Trump has to say, there's nowhere else I can go. Now, that's not the same thing. So social media is a unique situation that's developed recently with the Internet's growth and with the new world we live in. It's not the same as just an individual small business or even large business. As long as there's other options for us, I believe government control is not necessary. But in the case of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, there really are no other options that are comparable, and they do need to be subject to Section 230 and regulation. Okay. So, um, but I, I'm going to press you on this, though. Let's Please go back do. to the sex worker thing. Um, should we be allowing sex workers to use these platforms as they have since these platforms were incepted? Um, until they've been mostly deplatformed recently. And I'm not talking about posting lewd com content. That's, that's different. I'm talking about simply um, having a, an Instagram account where you post pictures of yourself, whether scantily clad or not. Um, those accounts are being suppressed. It's a huge, it's a huge thing that's tied to an anti-sex trafficking law. Um, so I'm only just using it as like a proof point. Like how would you apply the same rules to something like that, which, you know, is not necessarily tasteful to everybody. I believe that goes to their advertising policies and advertising policies can be restricted by a business. We don't want to allow things that go against social decency norms to be advertised um, in my newspaper, in my magazine. For example, I remember when cigarettes and tobacco could be advertised in magazines, and then all of a sudden that was no longer allowed. I had no problem with that. But free speech is different. I'm concerned with free speech and the fact that censorship is depriving me of my right to free speech. And if there's nothing else important in this country, it's free speech and all of our freedoms. That cannot be taken away or we've lost the country. Okay. Um, so let's go to your other, another one of your points, which is uh, your promises, which is to protect the right to life. Um, I understand that you're pro-life, but you then say that is why you had pledged to fight to stop taxpayer funding of abortions. So I just want to clarify, does this mean that you do or do not oppose the right to choose as long as federal funding is not used? I am 100% pro-life. The idea of abortion turns my stomach. In no way, shape or form would I vote for or approve the use of federal money for Planned Parenthood or for money for abortions. And therefore, what more can I say? That's how I feel. Okay, but there's still a distinction between prohibiting somebody from getting an abortion, which they may pay for themselves, taking away that choice versus saying, I, su I don't support federally funding it. Do you, would you vote, say a law passed your desk um, that was aimed at uh, limiting access, not funding, but access, how would you vote? I am 100% pro-life. The idea of abortions sicken me. I believe it's being used in many cases of, as a form of birth control, and I stand against abortion. And I say again, 
I am pro-life. Okay. Um, do you think that, do you support uh, making like, for example, contraception more available? Uh, I mean, right, you know, standard contraception <laughs> um, more available to help combat, you know, the need for them in the first place, um, ex as well as sex education in schools? Absolutely. That makes common sense. Okay. Absolutely. So, and then other thing, death penalty. I have a problem with the death penalty because I'm aware of mistakes that have been made. Uh, so I am against the death penalty. Okay. I agree with you there, Bruce. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, so you also, going back to being available, uh, you another two of your points are to hold town halls in every county and your 48-hour rule. So you want to go ahead and talk about that? Yeah, you know, the reason a person runs for Congress in District 11 is to represent the district. And the only way you could do that effectively is to get out there. I love District 11. There's nothing I enjoy more than getting in French fry, filling it up with grease and driving all over the district. And when I get out there in the rural areas and drive through the beautiful mountains, it just puts a smile on my face. One thing I want to do is get to every district as much as I can meet with district leaders, meet with the people, meet with the sheriff, meet with the commissioners, and attend all the town hall meetings, the chamber of commerce meetings, the rotary meetings, and listen. What I want to do is listen. I talk a lot, but I listen a lot too. So that's one way to, uh, to do my job. As far as the 48 hour rule goes, it's important that if I get elected, everyone knows that if you reach out to me or my office, you will not be neglected. I pledge to get back to you, either myself or someone on my staff, within 48 hours of my office being contacted, we will not neglect you. That is the job I am being hired to do, and I promise that you will not be neglected. I will respond within 48 hours to any and all contacts or inquiries. Okay, great. So let's move on to another one of your points, which is that you would advocate teaching critical thinking, not critical race theory. Um, can you tell us what you understand critical race theory to be and what you find troubling about it? Yes, I have been a teacher. I have substitute taught in secondary, primary, and even elementary school. Let me share with you something. I substitute taught in a Spanish class and I went in there with no lesson plan at all because they didn't leave me one, but I decided to conjugate verbs with the class in Spanish. And I looked at the front of the class when I walked in and there was a piñata hanging in the front of the class. The piñata was Donald Trump. That's one example of what's going on in the schools. You talk about trying to brainwash kids. Well, you know what a piñata is. You're Latina. So can you imagine a Donald Trump piñata? Come on. What kind of a message does that send? So getting back to critical race theory, I believe we are not a perfect country, but I believe we're the best country the world has ever known. I believe the Constitution is one of the greatest documents ever written. I believe in our history, we have done things that today would not fly, would not pass muster. I believe in our history, we've done things that may be seemingly bad, and they may not be uh, something we're proud of. That being said, this country has continually improved. I believe we are continually moving towards racial equality and eliminating racial injustice. Maybe we're not perfect, but we're continually improving. I know I'm not a racist. My God, I'm a Jew. I, my, my, my people have been discriminated against for centuries. I, I was enslaved to build the pyramids, for God's sake. So I know what it's like, but I believe this country is the greatest in the world. Critical race theory should be replaced with critical thinking. In other words, teach our students the good, the bad, and the ugly. Don't hide anything, but teach the students how to analyze it for themselves and come up with their own opinions. Do not try to sway their thought do not try to brainwash them into thinking we're a terrible country and certainly do not pit one color against another color or one ethnicity against another ethnicity. You know, there's nothing wrong with being white. 
There's nothing wrong with being black. There's nothing wrong with being an Indian. There's nothing wrong with being an Asian. In my opinion, we are all Americans. We all want the same thing. And this idea of pitting people against each other by the teaching of critical race theory, I don't know where it comes from, but it's ridiculous and it needs to stop. Yeah, well, it comes from higher education and it's a it's a sociological theory that I had personally never seen uh, lay people, if you will, talk about. Um, and I'm sorry, it actually is a legal framework and then it was adopted by sociology. So um, somehow it escaped into the population and I do think that it's fairly misunderstood based on its original intent and meaning. Um, so, all right, let's shift to a couple other policy questions then. I think we've kind of gone through your contract, uh, unless you, you think I'm, did I miss anything? Uh, you're very thorough and I appreciate you hitting on all the points. Okay, great. So, all right, let's talk about healthcare. Um, I, I always joke, with the Republican candidates, especially, I assume you don't believe in Medicare for all. Um, I believe, well, I, what, what I do believe in is that everyone should be able to have access to good medical care, but the Affordable Care Act is a, is a disaster. I know my, my personal health insurance went up four times, and I know my deductible went up about three times, and I know that when I want to go see my doctor, half the things I want to get done, he says he can't do because of the Affordable Care Act. So maybe more people have access to health care now, but it's not the same health care. And certainly these huge deductibles basically mean, at least for me, that my health insurance is basically catastrophic health care, which means I pay for my own medical bills now unless it's something catastrophic where I get above a $10,000 deductible. And I don't know if that's such a good thing for most people because, you know, most people don't have catastrophic illnesses. They have regular everyday normal illnesses that require going to the doctor and getting prescriptions. But if you've got a $10,000 deductible, what good is that? No, um, yeah, there's there's definitely some huge gaps that the ACA has left. So, what would your approach be of high level to rectifying the situation and, you know, making things more accessible? Because we do still have many folks who are totally uninsured. Well, and then one, underinsured, like you're saying. Well, first of all, no one in this country, no one is deprived of medical care because I don't know of a single emergency room that turns anyone away. So that's the fact. Now, what do we need to do to rein in some of the costs of medical care? Well, first of all, we have the best medical care in the world and medical care is not cheap. I accept that, but we do have the best medical care in the world. But to rein in those costs, we need to look at several things. Number one, what is one of the biggest expenses for doctors? It's malpractice insurance. Why do doctors have to spend so much money to get malpractice insurance? It's because of the huge awards that they potentially face if they're sued. Well, who's responsible for those huge awards? It's the lawyers, it's litigators. We need to rein in malpractice awards and thereby reduce the cost of malpractice insurance. That's one thing we could do and pretty easily. The next thing, drug costs, big pharma. I don't know if you're aware of it, but when I go to Mexico, the same drugs that I buy here in the United States cost a fraction in Mexico of what they cost here. The only explanation for that is that big pharma is gouging some of us here in the United States and in other countries, there's the, the, they believe drugs are more of a right and they make them affordable. So we have to control the cost of pharmaceuticals. That can be done as well through legislation. So malpractice awards, controlling the price of drugs will go a long way in reducing the cost of medical care. Then we need to look at the hospitals and find out why hospitals charge so much. They charge so much for a Band-Aid or an aspirin because there's so many people that are getting into the hospital system that never pay their bills. Why don't they pay their bills? Because they're either not insured or they have a low wage job or they have unaffordable housing that they've got to pay rent on and they have no money left over 
to pay their medical bills. So how do we solve this problem? We solve it by better wage jobs, more affordable housing, reduce malpractice awards, reduce the price of prescription drugs, and from then it's a, a roller coaster ride to decreasing the cost of medical care in this country. Okay. Um, how would you go about uh, addressing, as you said, you know, low wages um, and housing, housing issues, excuse me, particularly in this district? Let's talk about housing, especially in this district, especially in Buncombe County. Once again, big government. I don't know if you've tried to build, but do you realize how many permits, requirements, regulations and inspections a person has to have to build a house. It's unbelievable. We need to cut that red tape. We need to save that money and put that towards the construction cost. We can reduce the cost of housing by reducing regulation, reducing the size of government. As far as wages go, wages are going up. One of the good outcomes of the pandemic is that wages are rising rapidly. I'm a businessman. I know that to get help these days, you got to pay more and I'm paying more and I don't mind it a bit. You know, I kind of think it's a good thing. I believe Pisgah Inn, where I work, we're paying top dollar now. And I think I'm getting a good supply of labor and I'm getting good quality labor. And I've got a happy team with good morale and a good culture. So paying higher wages is not going to break the bank. Granted, there may be some inflationary effects from that, but I don't think it's going to be a disaster. Anyone that says we need a government to set minimum wage is wrong. No one pays minimum wage around here anymore. No one will work for minimum wage. The government needs to get out of the way once again and allow the free market to determine what's a minimum wage, just like it's doing right now. Up at Pisgah, where I work, minimum wage is $15 an hour and up. And I don't need the government telling me to pay that. The free market works just fine. Well, um, what is, on that note, what is your overall opinion on the labor shortage that we're seeing here in the district, especially in Buncombe County and, and nationally as well? Um, now that the unemployment benefits have ended, um, you know, that was long thought to be part of the driver behind the high rates of <clears throat> unemployment, but it doesn't necessarily seem like people are flooding back. Um, what do you think is driving this and what, what can we do? Well, the workforce is aging. First of all, they're aging out. That's one problem. The next problem is we did pay people not to work. And I believe people got out of the habit of working. They just flat out got out of the habit. I also believe a lot of people in this area that stopped working have left. They've left the area. I don't believe they're here anymore. So to get workers back, we've got to be innovative. And that's what I'm doing. Number one, I'm paying more. Number two, I'm looking at providing housing because housing needs to be affordable. And if it's not, maybe an employer can help with that. Number two, we need innovative work programs to bring in foreign labor. You know, a lot of the big resorts in this area use programs like the H-1 visa program, the H-2B program, and other similar programs that do allow foreign workers to come in and work for a limited period of time and then return to their native country. These types of programs are not a bad idea. They need to be worked on and improved a little bit because they don't apply to me because of the months I'm open. I'm not able to take advantage of them because they're so restrictive. But that would be a good answer, too. And I do believe we have to take away the incentive not to work. We cannot become a welfare state. We cannot give people money to stay home. It's a bad plan. And well, I think the incentive has been taken away. So how would folks who... How would folks be surviving, do you think? That's easy. The incentive has been taken away. I've got jobs. Come apply. I'll hire you tomorrow. How's that? And I'll pay you $15 an hour or more. And I'll give you a ride to work and I'll take you back home. How's that? <laughs> okay. Um, so I know you are very passionate about the environment. So let's talk about that quickly. Um, what's your stance on climate change in general? Do you believe that it's caused by man? 
I believe there is climate change happening. But you know, 13,000 years ago, there was an ice age. And when the ice age came and the planet froze over, I don't think that was due to man. Well, there have, been, there have been five prior total, uh, near total extinctions on yes. this planet. Yes. Um, the way this one is tracking, though, is very different. And I be- that is why many people believe that it is caused, at least in part, by man. Um, but regardless of why it's happening, what do you think we can do about it? And, I mean, is there anything that we should be doing how would you approach it in Congress? I'm not a climate change denier, as I just said. What I did say was 13,000 years ago, an ice age occurred. That was not man-made. Let me continue. Man does have an effect on the climate. I totally think that's true, but I don't think we're the sole effect. I believe natural cyclical occurrences play an important role, but I believe man can do more. I am a steward of the environment. If you look at my record, at Pisgah it speaks for itself as to how I feel about good environmental stewardship. And as I say, I drive a car every day that runs on waste vegetable oil. Don't forget that. I care about these mountains and I care about the environment and I'm doing everything I can do to be a good steward of it. I do believe in alternative energy. I do believe where it works, wind, solar, hydroelectric, geothermal, and even nuclear should be used not everywhere there is no one silver bullet but if i've got hydroelectric capability next to me that should be tapped if i live in a windy area a windmill is not a bad idea if i've got a restaurant that produces lots of waste vegetable oil then i should buy diesel engine powered cars and power them with that oil there's not one silver bullet man can make a difference if you look back at my record you'll see i was in support of the clean smokestacks act that help clean up the air in this area. If you look at Pisgah and you'll see urinals in the bathrooms that don't use any water. You'll see tankless water heaters. You'll see LED lighting everywhere. You'll see solar hot water panels on the roof and you'll see photoelectric electric panels, solar electric panels on the roof of the hotels. I didn't do this because I don't care about the environment. My record is proven and the, the facts are there about how I feel about the environment. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're doing everything that you can possibly do um, in your life and in your business. And the car is pretty impressive. (laughs) Um, So uh, we are about at time. Is there anything very briefly that you would like to say to the listeners before I go ahead and wrap this up? Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. I hope this gets out and gets my beautiful face out there for people to look (laughs) at. And I hope they'll consider voting for me. I'm not going to be your typical politician. I'm a businessman. I'm doing this for the right reasons. I'd also like to say that I'm having an open house event at Pisgah in October the 10th from 12 to 5. I'd like to invite everybody up there to see the change and be the change. All you've got to do is email me at bruce at bruceoconnell.com, and I'll send you an invitation to come up to Pisgah in October the 10th from 12 to 5, for an open house where I hope to meet everybody and be able to chat and answer questions. Uh, I can't be bought or coerced. I'm not in this for the fame. I'm not in this for the money. I'm in this to serve the district and serve the country. I think I can do a good job and I appreciate your support and your vote in the March primary. Very important, everybody. Don't forget, one way or another, you've got to get out and march and vote. Don't forget, vote in the March primary for whoever you think is the best candidate. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Bruce. Once again, you've been listening to WPVM 103.7 on your dial and globally at WPVMFM.org. Thank you again to NC11 Republican congressional candidate Bruce O'Connell for joining me today to share his campaign and platforms with the community. Um, you just mentioned that people can reach you at bruceoconnell.com or bruce at bruceoconnell.com, but they can read about you at your website. Yes. Um, don't forget that you can view this broadcast archived on WPBM's Facebook page or website. Tune in for upcoming candidate interviews on WPBM with Democratic candidate Eric Gash and perhaps some others. 
Please note that you can also view past candidate interviews archived on the WPVM Facebook page and website. Thank you again and stay tuned.